Our lesson for February the 12th is entitled, First Things First. The key verse is Haggai 1.7, which says, This is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. The scripture is Haggai 1, verses 1-15. through 15. The lesson focus, we must give God first place in our lives. In the overview, it says that pride is the primary manifestation of sin in human beings. It is what C.S. Lewis called the great sin. From the time we are born, we are self-centered. This self-conceit is at the root of nearly all problems between people and even within ourselves. The self-promotion that we believe will be satisfying is ultimately unfulfilling. Over time, we experience the dissatisfaction that comes from being self-focused. There is a better way to live, and Haggai points us toward it. Those who follow the Lord and put Him first will discover a more fulfilling life. In the introduction, it says that some people think that a noble way to live is to sacrifice oneself to a lofty and meaningful goal. While that has a noble sound to it, and many of us make a start in that direction, it is devilishly difficult to continue, and we often abandon that higher goal. In today's lesson, we see that the people of Judah who had formerly been exiles in Babylon, returned to Jerusalem and started rebuilding the foundation of the temple. Unfortunately, they changed course and became self-absorbed instead of self-sacrificing until the prophet Haggai came with his message from the Lord. As we study the scripture, we'll discover how we can do a better job of making God's priorities our priorities. In part one, it says our priorities are often self-centered. The text is from Haggai 1, verses 1-4, through 4, which says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? The first words of Haggai's prophecy reveal that life had dramatically changed for God's people. No longer was their life dated by referring to the succession of the royal descendants of David on the throne of Judah. Now foreigners ruled, we find ourselves placed in the second year of King Darius, the ruler of Persia. How did the Jewish people get to this point? In 586 BC, Judah fell to the Babylonian army, and thousands of Jews trudged into exile in distant Babylon. Then in 536 BC, the Persians conquered Babylon, and the Emperor Cyrus permitted Jewish exiles to return to their homeland. Nearly 50,000 did so, settling in and around Jerusalem. They set about restoring the city, including the temple. Under the leadership of Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, they cleared the rubble from the temple courts and rebuilt its foundation. However, after a few months, opposition arose and a new emperor ordered the work to be stopped. In 520 BC, the prophet Haggai appeared with the word of the Lord. His ministry only lasted five months, but he had a powerful message. Haggai did not condemn the people for their sins of idolatry, unrighteousness, and injustice, as other prophets had done. Instead, he focused on their apathy concerning worship and service to God. Why did they neglect the rebuilding of the temple for more than fifteen years? They excused themselves by saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. In reality, there was more here at stake than the construction of a building, even a building as important as the temple. We, too, make excuses for our failure to be diligent in worshiping and serving God. We may say things like, 
I know I should tithe, but finances are tight right now. Or, I know I should do more for others. This is a busy time at work. Or, I know I should witness to my co-workers, but there just doesn't seem to be a good opportunity. Good timing is important. If our priorities are truly in the right place, we'll find the right time to honor God and obey His commands. Haggai confronted the people with the fact that they seemed to have plenty of time and money to construct their own paneled houses while leaving the temple a ruin. While they procrastinated in doing what God called them to do, they found a way to make life more comfortable for themselves. Self-centered people always find time to do what they want to do. Ironically, while we give priority to what we want, we often feel dissatisfied. In part two, it says, Having misplaced priorities leaves us dissatisfied. And the text is from Haggai 1, verses 5 and 6, and verses 9 through 11, which says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Four times Haggai challenged the people to give careful thought to their ways. This is similar to Jeremiah's invitation. Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. If we honestly examine the results of our behavior, often we will realize how unproductive and dissatisfied we are. For the ancient Jews, their planting resulted in little harvest. Their eating, drinking, and dressing produced no sense of well-being, and their hard-earned money vanished as if their purses were riddled with holes. The pursuit of happiness is often unfruitful. Another way to check the connection between our striving and our happiness is to ask, what will I lose if I seek my priorities and refuse to follow God's plan? Haggai answered, what you expected turned out to be little. Since the majority of the settlers in and around Jerusalem were farmers, they understood Haggai's references to dew and drought. Moses predicted these failures hundreds of years earlier in his farewell address warning if you do not obey the Lord your God, and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. When we abandon God's priorities for our own, we are really practicing idolatry. The pursuit of happiness is most meaningful when attached to godly priorities. In part three it says, we are most fulfilled when God's priorities are our priorities. And the text is from Haggai 1, verses 7 and 8, and verses 12 through 15, which says, This is what the Lord Almighty says, Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obey the voice of the Lord their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. 
They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month. Haggai declared this message was from the Lord Almighty. This expression occurs nearly three hundred times in the Old Testament, and it means God is absolutely sovereign, having no rival. When Haggai instructed the people to bring timber from the mountains in order to build the house of the Lord, we wonder what happened to the cedar logs cut down sixteen years earlier. Had they rotted on the ground? Had the people stolen them to use in their own paneled houses? Both explanations are poor excuses for failing to do what God commanded. God's pleasure does not come so much from building as it does from the obedience of his children. How wonderful it would be for the kingdom of God if we could say that every church obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, as these people did. How significant it would be if we could truthfully say that all Christians fear the Lord. This is not a fear that causes us to cringe in terror and apprehension. Rather, it is an attitude that stands in awe of God. It causes us to depart from evil, and, though trembling, we rejoice in the Lord. More than a hundred times in the Old Testament, God promises to be with his people. Surely we can make God's priorities our priorities if we know he is with us to help us. In order to give adequate motivation for the work, the Lord stirred up the spirit, not only of the leaders, but the whole remnant of the people, with the result that they began to work on the rebuilding of the temple. It is no small thing to have one's spirit stirred up. Haggai's report that the work began on the 24th day tells us this dramatic change occurred in just 23 days. How long will it take us to move from our self-centered behaviors to putting God's priorities first in our lives? The change from a self-centered life to a God-centered life is 180 degrees. In today's life application, it says that C.S. Lewis said, put first things first and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first and we lose both first and second things. Has that been true in your life? How would you evaluate your own priorities? Make a list of the five most important things in your life. If we are honest, most of us will probably have two lists. One that is the list according to what it should be and the other is the list according to the way it is. What would it take to shuffle your list so that God and his work have the proper places of priority? The real challenge is not just to shuffle the list on paper, but to shuffle it in life. What will you do this week to come closer to the ideal priority list?